Sorry. My clock is not right. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Tim, for that introduction. Um, there is a letter to the editor on, on the way to the New York Times uh, book review. Um, she gave me some hostages to fortune. Uh, I only have one lesson for today from Lincoln, uh, but it's a very important one, and that's that we should pay as much attention and as serious attention to the Founding Fathers as he did. Abraham Lincoln was absorbed with them throughout his life. The most famous expression, obviously, is in the Gettysburg Address, where he says, our fathers set forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty. That was November 1863. But three years before that, February 1860, in the Cooper Union Address, his first important speech outside of Illinois, the kickoff of his first presidential campaign, he said of slavery, as our fathers marked it, so let it be again marked. As, a, as an evil to be restricted, let us speak as they spoke on it, and let us act as they acted on it. And six years before that, October 1854, in a speech in Peoria, Illinois, one of the longest he ever gave, three-hour speech, laid out the themes that would guide him for the rest of his career. He said, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us turn and wash it white in the spirit of the revolution. Now this afternoon, I want to look at the three founding fathers who were most important to him. He encountered them at different periods of his life, drew different things from them. George Washington, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson. I also want to talk about his actual father, Thomas Lincoln, because I think some of the yearning that Lincoln brought to his study of the Founding Fathers came from his disappointment with his actual one. And I'll talk about one last father uh, who's especially important as the Civil War dragged on, God the Father. Now, Thomas Lincoln uh, was born in Virginia. Uh, he married in Kentucky, began his family there. Uh, Abraham was born in 1809. In 1816, uh, Thomas moved his family to Indiana, which was then a brand new state. And then in 1830, he moved to Illinois, where he lived for the rest of his life. There was a fashion among historians in the 20th century of depicting Thomas Lincoln as a ne'er-do-well, uh, almost a bum. Scholars uh, have rejected that. They, they've moved on. Uh, Thomas Lincoln was a subsistence farmer and a carpenter all his life, but he never left bad debts. He served on several juries, which was a sign of respectability, if not of wealth. He was also a trustee of a frontier Baptist church in Indiana that the Lincolns belonged to. He sent his daughter, Sarah, and his son, Abraham, to uh, one house schools so that they could learn to read, write, and do simple mathematics. Uh, these were skills that he thought they should have. But Thomas and his son never got along. They never saw eye to eye. Part of that was a matter of labor. As soon as Abraham uh, reached his full growth, his father hired him out uh, to neighbors who needed fields cleared or rails split. And all the wages that Abraham earned, his father pocketed. Now, this was a common practice in those days, but common practices can strike different people different ways. And Abraham hated it, resented it deeply. A second difference between the two of them was that although Thomas wanted his children to learn to read and write, he didn't understand reading as an experience that would broaden and deepen you. He thought of it as a skill. 
but his son Abraham thought it was a portal to different worlds, a portal to understanding his own world and his own thoughts. Uh, his stepmother, uh, Sarah Lincoln, uh, who survived Abraham, was interviewed as an old lady. She described how her stepson, if he didn't understand something that adults were talking about, he would ask later, what did it mean? Then he would write it down. Then he would rewrite it in his own words until he was satisfied that he understood this. When he didn't have paper, he'd write it on a board with charcoal. And when he covered the board, he'd plane it off and write it again. And that's the kind of reaction that he had uh, to reading and writing. And this was beyond his father's ken. When Lincoln wrote a campaign autobiography in 1860 when he's running for president, he said of his father that he never learned more than bunglingly to write his own name. And I thought there's, there's so much feeling in that word, bunglingly. He could have said he never learned more than to write his own name, but he had to say bunglingly. And I think that meant I learned to do more. You didn't, because you didn't want to. So there was this gulf between the two men. Still, there were three things that Abraham got from his father, although he never acknowledged them. One was strength, physical strength. Uh, Thomas and Abraham were differently built. Thomas was 5'10 and stocky. Abraham, of course, we're familiar with his gangly figure, 6'4. But they were both strong, powerful men. And in early 19th century America, this was important because when you moved into a new community, there was communal hazing. You had to prove yourself to the local tough guy in wrestling or some other uh, form of contest. And both Thomas and Abraham had those experiences and they passed them. The second resemblance between father and son was that they were both temperate. They didn't drink alcohol. And in early 19th century America, this was very rare. Uh, Gordon Wood, in his book, Republic of Liberty, which covers the early American Republic, he gives statistics about annual consumption of hard liquor, and they're simply astonishing. Uh, this was a nation of alcoholics. And, and of course, what they were drinking was the worst possible stuff, I mean, from uh, distilled stuff from local stills. But neither of the Lincolns did it. A third quality of Thomas's that his son picked up was that Thomas was a great storyteller. And we know this from two cousins of the Lincoln family on, on Abraham's mother's side, uh, two brothers named Hanks, and, and both of them lived with the Lincolns for a number of years. And one of them said that Thomas Lincoln was as good a storyteller as Abraham, and the other one said he was even better. And we know that Lincoln uh, was a great teller of stories. He used it throughout his life to entertain people, to distract them, to keep them at a distance. And this was a quality that he got at home from Thomas. Uh, Thomas Lincoln, as I said, was a farmer all his life. He dies in 1851. Uh, Abraham named a horse after him, Old Tom and one of his sons, when he's going to Washington to be inaugurated uh, for the first time in 1861, he visited his father's grave. Uh, he saw that there was no stone upon it. He said, I'll have, to, I'll have to have one put there, but he never did. So that was the end of their relationship. And if we don't get what we want from our families, and no one ever gets everything he wants from his family. We look for it elsewhere. We look for surrogates and substitutes. And in early America, the handiest substitutes were the founding fathers, the generation of men who'd won the Revolutionary War and who'd written the Constitution. The last of them uh, died off in the 1830s, uh, but they were ubiquitous. Their reputations were everywhere. Uh, Lincoln never, uh, never met any of them, although their lives uh, overlapped. Thomas Jefferson retires from the White House just a few uh, weeks before Abraham is born. 
But uh, uh, young Abraham uh, never got to the East Coast where the Founding Fathers lived. None of them ever came out to what was then the frontier where he lived. So the only way he could encounter them was in books. One of the most important books which he read as a boy was a very popular one. It was by Mason Locke Weems, Parson Weems, called The Life of George Washington. Uh, and this was uh, the first biography of Washington that was published, uh, and it's still in print uh, today. Weems is one of those writers like James Fenimore Cooper or H.P. Lovecraft. His sentences aren't very good, but his stories are terrific. And the proof is that we know them. They're in the national mind. The most famous story, of course, is the story of George and the cherry tree that when George Washington is a little boy, his father gives him a hatchet, uh, and when he's swinging it around, he accidentally barks a prized cherry tree. Uh, when Mr. Washington sees what's happened, he, he asks his son, uh, how, how did this happen? Do you know who did this? And George says, I cannot tell a lie, Pa. You know I can't tell a lie. I did it. Whereupon his father praises him for his honesty. But that's not what impressed Lincoln in Parson Weems. He was not impressed uh, with Washington as a good boy. He was impressed with Weems's stories of Washington as a great man. And we know this because Lincoln said so himself in 1861 when he was on his way to his first inauguration. Uh, he left Springfield early in February. He took a train uh, through the Midwest and through part of the Northeast on his way to Washington. He was showing the flag as the country was splitting apart. And on February 21st, he came through uh, Trenton, New Jersey, and he gave a speech to the legislature. And he told the New Jersey State Senate, he recalled Weems's Life of Washington. He said he had that book as a little boy. And what most struck him in it was Weems's account of the Battle of Trenton. And he mentioned the crossing of the Delaware, the hardships suffered by the soldiers, and the struggle with the Hessians. And you would, you would think, and, and some modern biographers have said, this was a very obvious thing for Lincoln to say. It's the day before Washington's birthday. He's in Trenton, New Jersey. Why not refer to Weems and the Battle of Trenton? But the most important thing that Lincoln has to say about the battle is what Weems presented as the most important. He said, boy though I was, I thought that there must have been something important that those men struggled for, even more important than a war for independence, but something of value to all men at all times. And what Lincoln thought that was, was liberty. And if you read Weems' account of the Battle of Trenton, that's exactly what Weems says. Because after he gets Washington and his troops across the Delaware, they have to march a few miles onto the city of Trenton. And as they're marching, Weems introduces an allegorical figure hovering over them. It's a woman, the spirit of liberty. Weems says that she has been driven out of Europe She's come to the woods of America as her last refuge, but her enemies have followed her with soldiers and armies. Who will defend her? Only this little band of men. And before the Americans charge, the Hessians, Weems has Washington say to his troops, all I ask you to remember is what you are about to fight for. Weems presents the Battle of Trenton as a struggle for liberty in the world. And that's what Lincoln saw it as and what he sees his own uh, presidency as being. And he connects the two in this speech in Trenton. The second founding father that made a deep impression on Lincoln came to him in his 20s, and this was Thomas Paine. Now, Thomas Paine was, was one of the greatest journalists who ever lived. Uh, his uh, patriotic essay, uh, The American Crisis, uh, written before the Battle of Trenton, opens with the immortal uh, paragraph, these are the times that try men's souls. 
His pamphlet, Common Sense, sold 150,000 copies in January of 1776. In a country of three million, uh, the equivalent today would be 15 million. That's, that's a very good sale. But in the 1780s, Paine wrote another book which almost destroyed his reputation in the United States. And that was The Age of Reason. The Age of Reason was a furious assault on organized religion. Uh, Paine was not an atheist. He said, I believe in one God and no more. But he thought that all organized religions were systems set up to terrify and enslave mankind. And so in the Age of Reason, he makes some cracks at Islam, he makes more at Judaism, but uh, most of his criticism is directed at Christianity, which was the religion he'd been brought up in and the religion of most of his readers. And Paine uh, gives an account of, of when he says he first began to doubt. He says he was seven or eight years old and someone in his family gave a reading at home of a sermon on the substitutionary atonement. This is the doctrine that Christ died for our sins and that his death uh, pays the debt that we owe uh, for having sinned. Payne says he, he left, uh, left the house, walked out into the garden, and he remembers, I revolted at the recollection of what I had heard, and I thought to myself that it was making God Almighty act like a passionate man that killed his son when he could not revenge himself any other way. And as I was sure a man would be hanged that did such a thing, I could not see for what purpose they preached such sermons. Now, uh, the substitutionary atonement has, has been explained uh, for centuries by, by Christian theologians. But Paine was uh, taking a very literal take on this and on all other Christian doctrines. And it's very biblically based. Uh, he goes through the Bible looking for contradictions and apparent contradictions. And he's kind of the ideal adversary for a nation of Bible readers which is what America was. And the Age of Reason did circulate in America, including rural America. And Lincoln encountered Paine uh, when he was in his 20s in Illinois. In fact, Lincoln was so impressed with Paine that he, he wrote a pamphlet of his own making similar arguments. He, he was going to show that uh, Jesus was an ordinary illegitimate son uh, and, and that no one needed to read the Bible. Uh, he was telling his young friends about this one night. They were, they were gathered uh, around the stove in, a, in, in an older man's store. And this older man, whose name was Hill, asked to see Lincoln's pamphlet. And he put it in the stove. <laughs> the reason he did that is that young Lincoln was already interested in politics. And Mr. Hill knew that you won't go far in politics in Illinois in the 1830s if you write a pamphlet explaining that Jesus was an illegitimate child. So Lincoln learned to be circumspect about his early religious skepticism. Now, over the years, his religious opinions changed. But I think there was one thing he took from pain that never changed for him. It was permanently useful. And that was how to make serious arguments using humor. Paine is very good at this. Whether you agree with him or not, he is very good at making his points with jokes. Um, one, one such, he, he's talking about the virgin birth, and he asks, if any girl today were to say uh, that she got pregnant by a ghost and that an angel told her so, would she be believed? even if she swore to it. Now again, the, the virgin birth uh, has a lot of theology uh, that underlies it and that explains it, but this is a very literal way to talk about it. It's talking about a girl, an angel, a ghost, and it adds a humorous twist. So, so that's Paine's way of making a serious, aggressive point. And Lincoln himself would do this over and over again. Uh, in the 1850s and 60s, when, when Democrats would, would charge him and other Republicans with being, would, with being race mixers, this was a very common Democratic charge. Why else would Republicans 
be opposed to the restriction, to the expansion of slavery or to slavery. Well, they must want to sleep with black women. Uh, and there, there were many cartoons on this theme of supposed Republican celebrations where all the men are dancing with black ladies in low-cut dresses. It's a very uh, common Democratic cartoon. And Lincoln would respond uh, to such charges by saying, uh, just because I don't want a black woman for a slave doesn't mean I have to have her for a wife. I can just leave her alone. And again, he's taking uh, an abstract issue and he's making it very concrete. He's saying, here's me, here's this black woman. I don't have to go to bed with her. But he's also saying I can leave her alone, which means she can be free. So within the joke, there is a serious point. Uh, Lincoln did not have to go to Thomas Paine to learn to be funny. He already knew that as a storyteller from his father. But Paine shows him how to use humor to make serious points. The third founder that has a powerful impact on Lincoln is Thomas Jefferson. And Lincoln starts calling on Jefferson in 1854, the time of his Peoria speech, and continues to do so for the rest of his life. Jefferson had a very long political life. He's a complicated man, and Lincoln was aware of that. But the Jefferson that he admires is the young Jefferson, the 33-year-old man who wrote the Declaration of Independence and wrote in there and made that an American official position that all men are created equal. In 1859, Lincoln was invited to a celebration of Jefferson's birthday in Boston. He couldn't go but he sent them a message that he clearly worked over and hoped that it would be reprinted in Republican newspapers, and it was. He said, all honor to Jefferson, who had the wisdom and the forecast to insert into a merely revolutionary document a principle that would be valid for all times and for all ages. And he also said that Jefferson set forth the definitions and the axioms of a free society. And this is the Thomas Jefferson uh, that Lincoln quoted and referred to. His most famous reference, again, is the beginning of the Gettysburg Address. Because four score and seven years ago, four score and seven from 1863 goes back to 1776 and the year of the Declaration of Independence. And that's what Lincoln points to as the start of America's independent history. The Gettysburg Address was given at the dedication of a cemetery. And there was a lot of death in Abraham Lincoln's life. Uh, his mother died when he was nine. His sister Sarah died when he was 20. Uh, he lost a sweetheart. And Rutledge in his early 20s. And he had one of his four sons died in the 1850s, another died when he was in the White House. Uh, Lincoln only served in one war. It was an Indian war in northern Illinois called the Black Hawk War. He didn't see any action, but he did see men who had been scalped. And he remembered that on the top of every head there was a spot the size of a silver dollar. And he said that blood seemed to be everywhere. That was a very common experience of death in America in the 19th century. Uh, there was high mortality from disease, uh, and there were Indian wars in addition to the larger wars that we fought. But the Civil War was an uncommon experience of death. It was not something that Lincoln had ever seen before, ne never seen anything like it or contemplated it. And the war touched people that he knew. Uh, one of the first uh, battles in northern Virginia, uh, the Union took the city of Alexandria. And one of Lincoln's law students, Elmer Ellsworth, uh, led a charge of Union men into a hotel that was flying a rebel flag. He tore it down, and then he was uh, shot to death by the owner with a shotgun, who was himself a 
were killed by Ellsworth's second in command. At the end of 1861, in December, uh, Edward Baker, another friend of Lincoln's, was killed at the Battle of Ball's Bluff. Uh, Baker had been a friend of his in Illinois politics. Lincoln had named a son after Edward Baker. Baker was the man who introduced him to the crowd at his first inauguration. By then, Baker was a senator from Oregon. So he's killed in December 1861. Someone at the funeral said that Lincoln wept like a child. William McCullough was a court clerk from the judicial circuit that Lincoln traveled in Illinois. And at the beginning of the war, he asked the president-elect for help getting into an Illinois cavalry regiment. The reason McCullough needed Lincoln's help is that he only had one arm. He was a 50-year-old man who'd lost an arm in a farming accident, but he wanted to fight for his country and for liberty. So Lincoln got him in the cavalry regiment. He became a lieutenant colonel, then a colonel, and he was killed in December 1862 in the run-up to Vicksburg. Lincoln also saw damage done to people that he did not know intimately. A reporter named Noah Brooks accompanied him to a visit to a soldier's hospital. This was something that Lincoln and his wife frequently did. And as Lincoln and Brooks were going down the row of beds, there was a charitable lady ahead of them handing out tracts. And one young man uh, looked at the tract he was given, uh, laughed a bit, and tossed it aside. When Lincoln and Brooks came up to him, Lincoln gently reproved him, saying that the lady had good intentions. It probably wasn't nice to laugh at her tract. And the man said, well, she's given me a tract on the sin of dancing, and both my legs have been shot off. So uh, now that has the shape of a joke. It does have the shape of a joke. But the joke was on Lincoln and on the legless soldier, of course. So you multiply these incidents by 100 and by 1,000 and by 10,000. Because, of course, Lincoln is the commander in chief. He receives all casualty reports. All casualty figures go straight to him. And this is the toll that this war is producing. So Lincoln turns to a fifth father, God the Father. In 1862, he writes a note to himself. It was uh, not, not, not for public circulation, but his secretaries preserved it. It's uh, often published as the Meditation on Divine Will. And Lincoln tries to figure out, tries to explain what is happening, almost as if it were geometrical proof. And he begins by saying, God rules. He says, God cannot be for both sides at the same time. That would be a logical contradiction. But he may not be for either side. The war could not continue without his will. The war continues. Therefore, he must will that it does continue. And the culmination of these thoughts comes in the second inaugural, when the war is almost over, March of 1865. It's the most religious speech ever given by a president of the United States. And I'll read you two sentences. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? If God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now you can see from this how far Lincoln has traveled from Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was revolted at the notion of God 
requiring his son's sacrifice as the atonement for sin. But now Lincoln is telling America that God requires the deaths of thousands and thousands of sons, north and south, for sins of their fathers and their fathers' fathers for 250 years. It's also striking that in this speech, and it's really the only speech of the 1850s and 60s, except for the House Divided speech, the Founding Fathers do not appear. In the Gettysburg Address, the historical subtraction was four score and seven years ago that went back to 1776. But here the number is 250 years of unrequited toil. 250 from 1865 is 1615, that's Jamestown, the first American colony, the first American colony to buy African slaves. And the Founding Fathers have become a dimensionless point in this history of national slavery. But that's not the end of the speech. There's a last paragraph. Uh, it's one sentence. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And what struck me when I came to write about that is how many of those verbs are two syllables, verbs or verb phrases. Strive on, finish, bind up, care for, do all, achieve, cherish. And it seemed to me that it's like walking. It's as simple as walking. It's as hard as walking on when you've walked so far and you have so far yet to go. A month later, Lincoln was murdered and we still walk on. Thanks very much.